like you would envision going outside at night and try to light it up as bright as it is today with electricity, even on a cloudy, snowy day, okay? Or I'd like you to envision trying to pick up all the snow that's lying on the ground and raise it up to, say, 5,000 feet in the air, okay? All that tonnage of snow. The sun did that work. The sun makes our weather. The sun drives all the systems on this planet. As living beings, we're pretty interested in this job that sunlight does, photosynthesis. In this process, the sun takes basic common inorganic elements and turns them into biological stuff. As the basis of our food chain, we live at the top or one of the tops of the food chain, and we live off the sunlight, quite literally, and this is through this photosynthetic process. Those amber waves of grain are created by sunlight. That's the basis of all life on Earth, green plants. Oxygen comes from that, that's what we breathe. All the food on the planet comes from that. Here's a typical family of four, and all the food that they eat in a year, okay? I'd like you to help me out and envision behind them big piles of uh, oil drums, tonnages of coal, etc. Those are also, just to belabor the point, those are also made by sunlight. Coal, as you probably well know, is old plant matter that's been fossilized. Petroleum is old dinosaurs that have been fossilized. And they all started out with sunlight. So quite literally, just about everything we do that isn't a rock came from the sun. If we have an asphalt roll, it came from petroleum product, didn't it? We have an asphalt roof, came from a petroleum product. If we have a wood house, came from something that grew, it grew out of sunlight. So the first lesson I'm trying to say, if you're going to work with the sun, you've got to acknowledge its, its omnipresent importance. Avoiding that fact is kind of like trying to avoid gravity. It's just everywhere. Second thing you have to know about the sun is what Le Corbusier was trying to do in that, what, what he did in that diagram is show how the geometries of the sun change on a daily and yearly basis. Now, today, coincidentally, there are no coincidences, last night at 3.30 was the equinox, okay? If I were to say to you, sun rises in the east and sets in the west, no hands, but how many people would think that's true? Fact is, it isn't true. It only happens one day a year, sorry, two days a year on the equinox. The rest of the time, the sun rises and sets elsewhere. And if we can know that stuff, like Le Corbusier knew it, we can make a better, more responsive, more energy efficient, more site-specific architecture. The reason it does that is because of that 23.5 degree tilt of the sun on the Earth's axis as it goes around the sun. Now, I'm not going to belabor this. You can study the charts. This is all well covered. But your time would be well spent to get a chart and its sun chart or one of the old gay charts and look at that chart and study it for your latitude. These things vary as you change your position on the earth um, you know, from pole to pole. Study it and know where the sun is. You begin to see a lot of interesting stuff about what you might do with your village. Now this is kind of your basic notion of what many people think of as a solar building. Uh, kind of uh, 60 degrees sloping glass and pretty ugly without much going for it. Unfortunately, that's the PR that uh, we have to overcome in the solar architecture business. But in fact, there's a long history of other solar buildings. There's a book, The Golden Thread, which you have in the library, which shows 2,000 years of, of solar architecture. I suggest you look at that if you want to see all the precedents. On, on the continent of North America, the first settlers from Europe brought with them a very responsive form of solar architecture, which this, this old farmhouse exemplifies. Uh, the first thing about it is it was built in stages. The left stage was the first stage, and it had addition to added arms there. But in the, even the first stage, its long axis faced south, and it had windows as big as they could make at that time. You couldn't make a piece of glass very big. And so those were big windows. It had a shady porch, which you see there, shading the lower windows. 
And these are all elements of solar architecture that people practiced until we forgot about them in whatever, the 50s or so. We'll come back to this later. Here's another solar building. This is a mill building in New Jersey. It's built like that to maximize daylighting, something we often just overlook when we talk about solar energy. But this building has that form with, those that, with that fenestration to try to make the daylight inside of it uh, as good as possible so people can work and be productive. Okay? Here's a building you would never think of as solar, but since it faces south, it's a perfectly acceptable solar building. It's got its blazing on the south, the same kind of uh, shading on the on lower windows, etc., etc., etc. So what I'm trying to do is break any preconception a person might have about what a solar building looks like. Uh, one of the things, the side light, is we have a lot of uh, different glazings in, in solar work, and we even have solar art forms when we come to something like stained glass. It's an art form that really only comes alive when, when the sun actually passes through it. So that's, this is actually a tiny little solar addition of mine installing. Three little stained glass windows that a, a person bought at a flea market in an attic space that had no prior day. Uh, here's the inside of that mill building. This is the kind of general light you get through the window before you deal with the textures and whatnot. Uh, on the other hand, when, once the light enters the building, it starts to do lots of stuff. It gets absorbed, it gets reflected, it gets transmitted. And that all depends on the kinds of surfaces you have, whether they're shiny and bright, whether they're light, whether they're dark and textured. And this is an element we manipulate in a solar room. In this room, we're trying to make it light and bright, and so we have lots of light surfaces bouncing light off. And this is a, basically a daylighting problem, which is manipulating the surfaces and the textures to maximize the light in the room. Now, once light comes in through blazing into a space, as you all know from getting into your car seat in the summer, it heats stuff up. That's the greenhouse effect. It turns out light can pass through a piece of glass pretty easily. And then when it lands on the surface and it gets absorbed, it, it turns into heat energy, and it's, an, it's an infrared energy which doesn't pass through glass too easily. That's the so-called greenhouse effect. So you're all familiar with the heat that we get out of sunlight once we let it be absorbed into the material. In these cases, it's just too hot. It's not useful for us. But we manipulate that variable by using mass or weight. That's why it's too bad those brick people all left in such a hurry. But actually, the American Masonry Institute, if I have the name right, has invested a lot in passive solar uh, systems because masonry weighs a lot, so when the sun gets absorbed by it, its temperature doesn't rise so much. So what we do when we're dealing with solar spaces is we manipulate the weight of them, quite literally. Now that's not such a bad deal. Stone, slate, okay? These are all great materials to build with, and they're another reason that solar architecture can be very exciting. Just by trying to satisfy the heat requirements, you're required to bring in some very exciting materials. Here's a space that's got direct gain on the right, and it's got a, a, a cast in place stone floor, and we'll look at this a little more later. But you can see some dark color choices and, and other choices such as that to raise the mass of the space. The drywall in a, in a regular house is a, a good way to count some of the mass of kind of people's double. And once we have glazing, letting sun in, the glazing is properly oriented, the sun's in our space, we've got some masonry in there, we're absorbing it, the temperature's not too hot. Now we have to get into some basics about not letting the heat out inappropriately. Now this would apply no matter what our fuel source is. It would be foolish to uh, burn oil wantonly and gas or any other fuel. But it applies especially uh, in solar systems. And what we have is it's always good to have a handle on at least the basics about heat points so that you can understand what's happening in any building, but especially the solar building. Now, I emphasize this because if you ask nine out of 10 people about heat, they'll say, well, heat rises. And that's wrong, dead wrong. Heat does go up and down at all. 
he travels in three different ways, and it always, if you want a simple rule of thumb, it always does the following. It always goes from the hot place to the cold place. It's like water flowing downhill. And you can do whatever you want, but you'll never stop it from getting from the hot place to the cold place. You can slow it down, and that's what you're always trying to do. Now, he will leave a, a building or travel from some place by either convection, which is warming some kind of a fluid, air or water, and then having that fluid rise because it's expanded and it's more buoyant. That's a very powerful force. If you think of Dorothy in the balloon in The Wizard of Oz, you can lift great weights with just expanded convective, you know, convective forces. He also traveled in radiation, which is how it gets from us, gets to us from the sun. It travels across voids, vacuums. We're warm bodies. We lose most of our heat by a large part of our heat by radiation. So window treatments and other uh, systems such as that are very important in solar buildings to reduce our heat losses. And finally, heat moves by conduction, which is actually flowing through a solid material. And that's where we get into resistance and R body. You can all think of having a copper pipe in one hand and a broomstick in the other and putting them both in a campfire. Now, does, most of you know which one you're going to drop first, right? The copper pipe is not resistant to heat flow. It's highly conductive. The wood is very resistant. You can even have one end of the room stick on fire, and it wouldn't be burning you at the other end. So in buildings, we can play with mass insulation to try to hold in the conductive heat flow. So here's insulation going on a masonry wall. Here's a project, just a quick one. This is an old addition to an older frame house. The addition is, is stuck on a block. And these people had a horrendous oil bill. So we came along and insulated it. And we uh, put up tar paper and stucco and stuck of it. And they ended up with exactly what they had in the beginning, except one-tenth of the energy usage. I point this out because they were so happy that many years later came back and asked me to build them a solar home because they knew what I was talking about, and I'll show you a picture of that later. Uh, another way we manipulate other than mass insulation is we choose where we put our windows. On the north, we might put small windows rather than large windows if we're trying to reduce heat loss. We choose what kind of spaces we put where. On the north, we might put closets. I don't usually get people complaining to me about how cold it is inside of a closet. So a closet can be a barrier, sort of a, you know, transitional space in the building. We do things like airlocks and, and various other spaces. Here's another closet. Here's a, here's a window between two closets creating a window seat. And it in fact has a couple of doors that swing out to close it off in the plane of the closet doors. Uh, convective heat laws, this is where people sometimes misconceive that, um, that heat rises. When, when air is heated, it does rise because it's buoyant. And this is something that we sometimes have to resist, and at other times we encourage. Here's a, a cupola or some kind of clear story, which is a magnificent solar chimney for helping to passively ventilate that structure, okay? If we would want to encourage in the sun that tall structure, we would encourage the forces of convection to cool in the sun. So sometimes we want to crack down on convection, sometimes we do not. So the general question would be, if you can create a space which has this wonderful ambiance and has growing stuff in it and uh, has been proven medically with all the research now on cabin fever, which seems to indicate it's really just a lack of sunlight that makes people crazy, it's dirt crazy. If you can make a space that will make people happy and healthy and grow stuff, why wouldn't you do it? I mean, why wouldn't you do it? Okay? And that's the basics of what solar architecture are all about. Trying to harness these forces and manipulate them and use them to create spaces that people can use and live in. Now, this is the first solar house I ever built. It's not a passive house, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about it because we're talking to build a passive house. It was built for some people who, <coughs> excuse me, who, uh, who wanted those round huts. They had actually lived many, many, many years in Africa. But they were also willing at the time, this was 
1974 or 5, to uh, experiment with solar energy. We got some plans on how to make a solar collector. Came up with this scheme to put a collector on the roof and masonry storage in the foundation at the bottom. And we would have fans circulating the heat from up on the roof down into either storage or into the rooms directly. It was very sensible and logical. Here's the masonry storage going in. It also served as a foundation. We made a couple of little mistakes to really insulate as much as we should have in that kind of structure. At that time, by the way, there were no solar, active solar houses in New Jersey built in that time frame. This is real early stuff. I, mean, I have no embarrassment about making mistakes at that time. Here we are building a collector on the roof. There was wire mesh you might think of as plasters, lads. We painted it black same paint they use on the inside of the camera, so it was really highly absorbent of sunlight. We put cowl on the top. We did a lot of recycling. That piece of tin on the roof is actually an old printer's plate from the local newspaper. We used to do all the flashing and stuff in the building. We made those little printer plates. When we made this collection, that was very, 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 very successful. It got hot up there. But we had trouble with it. We had a lot of controls. Uh, there, at that time, a lot of these controls didn't exist, so that was all handmade uh, controls for how to make the thing work. And um, a lot of fans and ductwork. That we had not really allowed enough space for some of that fan and ductwork. And it was always going out and this, that, and the other. And I was the fellow who lived in the area, so I had all the callbacks. And I used to go up there pretty regularly. And one time when I went up there, uh, the fan had been out, and the, uh, the woman who lived there said, oh, I've been noticing. Well, I was sitting here all this time with the solar collector off and out of commission because, you know, the fan housing was uh, scraping or something. I was getting all this free solar energy through the windows. And this is, in fact, an interior shot of some of that free solar energy coming in the windows. And that was the big epiphany for me. If you could get the sun to actually distribute the heat directly into your spaces and avoid all those fans and controls, you'd be really on to something. And that's the basic principle of passive solar as opposed to quote active solar, is to try to manipulate, bounce the sunlight into your spaces and avoid all these distribution systems. So we go back to that old farmhouse now. Uh, as I've explained to you, this is a prime solar location, uh, 9 out of 10 in the barn. You rarely see one that doesn't face out. And this one has the roof all destroyed. It needs to be replaced. I happen to know the owner, and I suggest, well, maybe we can come up with some kind of a, a collector. It won't be the ideal angle, but we can replace your roof, and if we are a little careful, we can make it some kind of a solar collector also. She said yes. So what we did was, is we cut holes down the lower holes are at the ceiling of the first floor. We're going to bring air out of the ceiling of the first floor over our absorber plate and put it in at about window height on the second floor. We had to reframe. As long as we're in there, we put what insulation we can on the side of the building because there's no insulation anywhere, but any insulation helps. And then we continued building. We put insulation on the back of the collector. It was a very low cost job, so our absorber plate is just some uh, corrugated aluminum, which we painted black on site. We glazed the whole thing with corrugated fiberglass. Pretty simple installation, a lot more uh, caulking than you would normally use because we're worried about air sealing. And we've got ourselves a new roof, which for a little extra effort is also a solar collector. And what we have is a direct gain passive window and a little active system, that little fan right there, which kicks on whenever the temperature in the collector goes up to whatever it was set at over 85. Now, I didn't do this uh, job, but I would be proud if I had. I think for, you know, $25 worth of polyethylene, that's a really good solar addition. And I put it in here because I want you to know that it doesn't necessarily cost a lot of money to do solar work, and that's something that people sometimes think. It can, and I can, I'll show you that later. But you can also, if you're just harnessing these basic principles, harness them with some pretty low cost material. Uh, on the other hand, there are, and this is one of the areas that in the last 20 years have really improved, there are some very excellent blazes. 
This is an older uh, Pella window with slim shades. That's a good way to modulate how much sunlight comes into the room. Uh, nowadays, you can buy windows which are low E. They have a coating to reduce the radiant heat losses. They're filled with argon gas, which makes it harder for the convective losses to lose heat. You get an R4 window, standard from any manufacturer. But this window was about an R2 at the time it was installed. So what we have is we've had an immense improvement in the glazing systems, and it's something you should keep up on and study uh, as you do any solar work. Here's an interim solution. This is an existing south-facing porch on our old farmhouse with a kind of a, a panel system. These are all cheap plexiglass, real eight-inch stuff, and a very cheap frame built around them. This gets installed in the late uh, fall, removed in the uh, late spring. And what you have here is, is an attached sun space for next to nothing. Uh, what an attached sun space is, is the space that you don't necessarily use all the time. It gets hot out there and it's luxuriant. You open the windows and doors and you gain the heat from this space. At nighttime, you close the windows and the doors and it gets cold out there. You don't care. You're not living out there. You're just gaining free heat from it. The other benefit you are gaining is you're losing less heat because the, the enclosed space acts as a buffer. And that part of the building that attaches to it has less of a heat difference to the outside. So you actually lose less heat for it all, for it all side. So this glass paid for itself for the season or two. Very, very effective. That plastic paid for itself. So in general, you should just take away from this. This is a, a new home bubbling well, this a long time ago. But this is the kind of elevations you start to see on the south of the solar house. A lot of glass, some some way of venting up top, real high, taking advantage of the thermal siphoning, with some way of venting on the bottom. This is facing south. This is an attached two-story sun space. All the interior spaces have access to it through windows and doors and balconies. You see the, uh, the roof there that isn't quite sheathed, but when it gets sheathed, it's going to be sheathed with syro or transparent material. We're very covetous of our glass. We don't want to uh, let it get shaded inappropriately. So these are all features of a southern exposure on a, uh, on a solar home. And this is the same house on the north. No windows to speak of, okay? That hole in the roof is where the chimney's going to come through. The two windows are for cross ventilation and, and for uh, egress in the uh, bedrooms. The space closest to us, the volume closest to us, is a uh, garage, perfect space to put on the north, right? Cut down, keep off. And so this is uh, getting pretty close to an ideal northern you know, solar exposure. Almost no windows, all ancillary space. Here's a project we built early on, which was built all out of recycled timbers that came out of an old, old Philadelphia row house. Uh, this was a, a, pardon me, a uh, stagnating, what we call a stagnating trom wall. The masonry block that's behind there is going to be stuck on black, and then there's going to be glazing on the surface, and it uh, then becomes heated by the sun by the same process, and the heat migrates through it into the inside living spaces, which are beyond the wall. In addition, uh, we developed this kind of framing system, which is sort of a pseudo post being building up these timbers we had. That was the kind of framing system we used. Uh, insulation was on the exterior of this building, which is something we also do in solar work. And this building also had these skylight systems. Uh, this is the northernmost skylight, because it was a very deep building. So we developed a series of skylights, all framed out of this terrible work, but it had nails in it and everything else. It was terrible stuff, but made a decent house. And, this, me, and here's the interior while under construction. I show it at this stage for a lot of reasons, but one is that's something you know whether you've got a good solar design even at this stage of the game, because it's all day living. Right? Typical tract house, you need lighting on a dark day inside. In a solar house, ideally, you wouldn't need and not a light bulb on when the sun was shining anywhere in the house, not even in the closets in the back, if you had planned it. Okay, I'm going to go through a, a project here from start to finish to give you some of the variables. This is uh, what was built as a low cost kind of modification of that basic farmhouse. What we're going to do is add a greenhouse instead of the front porch. We're going to add a greenhouse in this area. 
and we're going to have the greenhouse heat air and send it up into the top of the house and come down that back wall and out these holes in the bottom of that wall and cross what's a crawl space under there and then be reheated again. We're going to make a convective loop. It's going to be driven by the sun. It's going to be fair, fan. And uh, we've insulated, we put in our foundation and we've insulated it around. Uh, here we are putting in the slab, and we've got, uh, let me show you the insulation underneath the slab. We have to be real careful about insulation. We can insulate everywhere uh, from the ground. A lot of people say, well, it's kind of almost warm under there. It's not almost warm, 55 degrees. It's not almost warm for people's comfort. So uh, at this level, across here, is where the crawl space is going to go. Where the first floor is going to go creating the crawl space. So here's the frame going on to the second floor. <clears throat> Here's the second floor frame with the roof rafters going up. You can start to see, this is a winter day, you can start to see the deep penetration of the sunlight into the house there. And uh, you can see that mass uh, that is going to get exposed and stored the heat. Yes? <laughs> that insulation is uh, a sprayed in place polyurethane foam insulation. Um, so what we have here is the shell of the house starting to take shape. Uh, this is the north wall. These are 12 inch blocks. They're going to serve as the plenum. So they are, once again, we're adding mass. Everywhere we go, we're adding mass, adding mass. The heat is going to be extracted from the area of this wall. Here we are framing off. Those of you in the, in the studio at a tree party too, so you know, you know what a good place to be. Uh, here's the house. It's signed up with. Um, locally sawn, rough sawn lumber, and those uh, are shingles off another project into a little solar mandala. So here it is. It's a little bit of a clunker, but if, if you can see how it takes the same form as the farmhouse, except we replace the, the porch with the greenhouse. And you should look at that greenhouse. It's a prefab greenhouse. We had to turn it on its side. That's exactly perpendicular to the way the manufacturer wanted it, so that we could get enough loft. And that greenhouse is the furnace for this house. Uh, in addition, you have the direct gain on the second floor. Now, uh, I want to caution you. I rarely use roof glass or slope glass. And I'm going to show you a few examples. It's, it's, in this case, I've used it because these people were truly gardeners. And they truly needed a growing and working greenhouse. But in typical cases, I advise against it because the roof glass is a liability. It, it gains most of its sun in the, winter, in the summer, so it's a liability in the summer. It's a big heat gain. And in the winter, it's a heat loss without gaining much sunlight at all. So we stay away from roof glass except in real growing greenhouse situations. Uh, this is the only other heat in the house. It's a little yellow stove. It's about the size of one of these chairs. It's right dead center in the house. That's all there is. There's no furnace, there's nothing else. You can see the masonry on the floor uh, as a floor tile. We'll see more of that later. Here's the planting bed going in. That's more mats. You can see the grills coming up from the crawl space. Okay. Uh, this is the kind of door. This is all made from available parts to be low budget. But that's a door. You can see how little penetration there is of sun into the space of the summer, which is what this is. So the greenhouse is acting as an attached space, uh, overheating, acting as a heat shield for the rest of the house in the summer. Uh, these are other devices we use. There's an awning on top of the greenhouse to turn it more into that porch. Uh, the vegetation itself actually transpires and cools in addition to shades. Uh, the owner is even going to these beans in the summer and plant them there just they're a perennial. Annual, annual. And uh, they shape the greenhouse itself in the summer with these exterior plants. Uh, here's this upstairs again with the uh, second floor. You have a masonry floor. It's about an inch and a half uh, concrete tile, poured in place, uh, real rough finish to look like a, a large terracotta tile. Here's the kind of woodwork uh, that goes into some of these houses. You've got here a uh, stone. Excuse me, your block wall on the left, articulated with some 
Uh, the trim work is painted brown to be more absorptive. You've got your tile floors. You're looking directly ahead through a window into the sun space. At the landing of the stair, you're looking through another window, maximizing the amount of sunlight that comes through into the house, but with controls, you can put shades in there as required. Uh, up above is a vent where the hot air comes out of the top of the greenhouse itself into the second floor. And above that is a window looking out into the, you know, directly out into the landscape. A little solar decoration at the top of the stairs. The stairways themselves, but mostly to show the tiles on the floor. They were pretty successful for a real cheap way to cover the floor with a lot of mass. And this kind of uh, woodwork is unfortunate enough to work with people to do that. Now this is the biggest liability when you build a solar house. People are always coming around and bothering. Okay? So you have to watch out for that. I want to show you this slide. Even that white gravel is a move. We don't have snow cover all the time. So the white gravel is an attempt to increase the reflectance of the, of the surface out in front of the screen. Anytime we can do that, where we increase the reflected light that comes through an aperture, for the same size window, if we can get direct sunlight plus the reflected light in, we get more sunlight per opening, more heat in, less heat loss out. We try to do that. So in this case, we did it uh, even on the ground. Now, this house went so far as to even have a solar septic system. It's in an area where perks are hard to get, and uh, they require sand mounds, which are very expensive. And all the sand mound is is this elevated way to evaporate water in a kind of a dumb manner. So what we proposed and got permission to do was to build a basically enclosed pool insulated, fill it with dirt and pipe, put a greenhouse on it. We modified the greenhouse so that it had uh, insulation on the north and therefore try to reduce the heat loss. And then we planted uh, plants inside of it. So now what we had is the effluent in the, way, in the residential waste treatment system went to this place, couldn't go into the ground. It all had to be evaporated. It was being evaporated by plant transpiration and by solar uh, evaporation. The system's been up in operation since 1981. I've never gotten a phone call, so it seems to work out fine. A couple of other of them have been built. Uh, sorry about the darkness of this slide. This is a small little, uh, actually, a canal house in, in the town where I live, Lambertville, New Jersey. Uh, these, this fellow wanted an insulation situation like the one I showed you earlier in the show. But what I noticed was is that on the south, he had a south-facing wall, so we designed a tron wall here on an existing masonry building. We insulated it stuccoed on the east, west, and north, but on the south we stuccoed directly to the existing masonry with a black stucco. It is available. And we're here ready to uh, install our glazing system. In the lower right is a vent that the owner himself broke through, and that's where air is going to come from the house. It'll be in this collector space once we put the glass up. And it will re-enter the house in a similar vent that is behind the window you see at the top, at the ridge. The window you see at the ridge is for the summer mode. It will be open so that the air will be ventilated to the outside rather than into the house. And that window on the top is reached through the vent at the top. And there's going to be a vent in the glass at the bottom where it goes in in the summer rather than from the house. And you reach that one from the vent in the wall at the bottom. So uh, in quick succession, these are dark slides. Uh, there's the owner in his vent hole. There we are with a uh, framing system. This is a Syro framing system, a kind of an aluminum channel system, uh, ready to go in. Oh, by the way, that guy's a Ball State graduate. That's Greg Torsio. I should have never mentioned that. Uh, Greg worked with me for a number of years. He's a great fellow. Uh, there we are. We chose the Syro glazing. Uh, which comes in big sheets. It actually comes in 20-foot sheets or 24-foot sheets, so there's no muttons from top to bottom. And Syro is a two-layer uh, plastic sheathing, which has these uh, cells in it, perhaps you're familiar with it. So it's a, a pretty reasonable insulated glazing. And we also can cut a hole in it to put the vent in. You can see the vent in the lower right-hand corner. So here's the vent. The vent is a trailer vent, you know, for your trailer. Ideally, it would have been clear plexiglass, but since they installed it in the roofs, it's dark. 
but I chose it so we got at least some transmittance through it and we didn't lose any sunlight. And that opens from the inside for summer venue. So there it is, the only Tom Walden land in New Jersey. It's been working for quite some time. Okay, that's the end of the first tray. How am I doing for time? What time is it? Okay. Now here's another trom wall that you probably all have seen or heard of. And this is uh, a curved trom wall. And the thing that happened here was uh, we lowered it because of the site. It allowed us to lower the trom wall. So the trom wall here is down below and there's a bank of windows up above. But basically down here you have from here to here a trom wall that you can stand in the house and look over to the windows. So you get both view and trauma wall heating out of this. And the windows, as we now all know, are also direct gain and you get heat out of them also. So uh, trauma wall sometimes is a problem when you, here is the solution you came up with. At other times, trauma wall is a great solution. Let's say you've got a Persian rug collection or something like that. You don't want any sunlight on it, but you want solar heat. You might choose a trauma wall in that kind of situation because it has very few openings into the main space. Once again, you saw the south side of that building, now you see the north, very few windows. We've got different forms here, but uh, it, in this case, again, the same principles are, are arriving. And this is the kind of uh, lighting you get inside, a space, a direct gain solar space. Uh, let's jump to suburban. Here's your typical suburban house in New Jersey, one of the different types. This is the street and also the north side. On the south side, we have one who wants to plant a potting shed, so we add this kind of little addition. In this case, we're dealing with uh, using standard uh, patio door replacement windows because they're the cheapest way to buy glass in the big size of their standard size. So we actually modulate the framing to accommodate those windows, which are these guys up here. And then down below, we build these little custom panels just screened directly in, you know, uh, shoot the screen in with a stapler and make a little piece of siro to close it off uh, when you don't want ventilation. So this is actually a low-cost solution uh, to build the port as, a, as an attached sunset. Uh, you get the same elements inside. There's the old window uh, from the kitchen or living room, wherever it was. Now it, it looks out into the sun space. Here's the potting sink and some woodwork you got your from these floors. Uh, there's the old door out of the house. It used to come out to the deck and now comes into the sun space with a new door out to the backyard. Uh, the framing here, we use a, a homosote system, thermosote, which we found good but expensive. It's a finished interior surface and then it's got insulation and then it's got a nailable surface on top for shingles. We've, in other cases, we've actually built that up ourselves. Uh, there, this area I'm showing you because we plan for uh, gallon drums of water, or five gallon drums of water to fine tune the So that kind of thing was designed in. And here's the level of transparency of that from the sap. It's very transparent kind of space as an attached sun. Uh, here's another quick one, another suburban house. Uh, existing porch. In this case, south is off to the right somebody, somewhat. Um, so we go with a curve so that the blazing faces more towards the southerly. And the people in this case uh, end up with something that looks like this. I'm sorry for the photography. And it's actually got a hot tub in the corner. We go with the, the, the curve in the corner. Uh, here's another one. Existing porch facing due south. Lots of decent, although in bad repair, you know, to, uh, turned woodwork and whatnot. Our job is just to come up with a way to glaze it permanently turn it into a sun space and take the credit for all the good work. Here's, that's not me, that's the owner uh, wondering what we're doing. And if you notice, I show this slide because there's this solar clothes dryer out in the backyard. Uh, there again, it's a quick shot of the same systems with the fixed glass and the uh, custom panels and local ventilation. Here's a slightly bigger project in which we have the same old farmhouse. Uh, to the right, we have an addition that's kind of, uh, you know, mid-20th century. 
On the north side, where we can't see in this photo, we have what used to be the summer kitchen, which got turned into the permanent kitchen, and what, which wants to become the, uh, the new kitchen. So we'll start there on the north. The first thing you find in these old jobs is that the foundation has no footing, so you've got to really start over. Second thing you notice is that the flip side of solar, when you're working on the north, you're still doing solar work. You still have lots of conservation issues you can deal with on the north. So we have a solution on the north. We find that this is the wall that was there. And we said as a design criteria, we're going to build a whole kitchen that loses less heat than this wall used to. So now, they won't have to have a bigger <coughs> furnace. They'll have actually a smaller energy bill and more usable space. It's not too hard. That's the only insulation that was in that room. And we're going to build two by six walls with uh, exterior insulation. And you know, we're going to make it really a good addition. But we want to set that, we set that as one design goal. So we're, here's the addition starting to take shape. We're going to actually give it a very tall roof for the same reason, to cover as much north wall as possible. So the roof line is going to go up and capture that window on the second floor, not on the third floor. And that's going to become an interior window. There's going to be a wood stove in this new kitchen space, and its heat is going to get to the second floor through that window. So that's all part of the design. Here we are setting the ridge for that roof. You can begin to see the roof line taking shape there. That's the reason for it, all those energy issues I discussed with you. Uh, here it is finished, OK? And we've captured all that space. And in fact, this addition uses less energy than the wall used to. We use windows selectively on the north. There's the kitchen sink looking out to a little creek across the road, and that kind of thing. On the east and west, we put these high windows because they do get morning and evening sunlight. So we take advantage of that. Uh, these are things if we studied our solar charts like with Corbusier, we would get to say, hey, a window up there really will get light in the morning. We can actually pinpoint it. And that's the kind of light that comes through that window. It casts that kind of thing in the kitchen all day long, which is one of the reasons solar spaces can be really nice because they vary from day to day, hour to hour, and season to season with the sunlight. Um, here on the west, we have another condition. That window on the lower most protrusion, that was the existing laundry area. It's a new laundry bathroom area. And that gray area is that same window. You see a shadow behind. So that's the laundry area separated from the bathroom by a translucent door that we made out of cow wall. So we have some degree of privacy and, and, and get daylighting into those shared daylight between those two spaces. Okay, now we're going to swing around. There, by the way, is the old kitchen we had to tear down over there. Uh, now, looking at this, we're going to now, where the chimney area is, put an addition on the south side of this house. It's actually a notch. It, this corner returns back to that house. Okay, the first thing we notice is that this traditional solar shape, probably we should go with that, the telescope addition. You know, just continued out towards it. Second thing we notice is, well, we're going to be able to capture that chimney from mass, which would be good. And we're actually going to reduce the heat loss because that chimney is just losing all the heat that goes up the flue and warms it up to the outside. Now it'll work to warm on the dish. Uh, so that was the basic scheme. We extend the telescope of the, the primal basic shape of that uh, main house in the center. And it's going to be a a uh, hot tub, one of those jobs, a hot tub on the first floor and a loft space on the second. So here it is. It's this new addition, but it kind of makes this statement, which may or may not be successful of. This is how big a window was, you know, in 1850, and how big a window can be in, in uh, 1980. But there it is. Um, on the inside, uh, we found this wall adjoining the addition to the house was full not so much of emptiness as mud bats. And one of the fellows on the job suggested, well, why don't we take all those sheet box scraps from the job we just finished in the back and cut them up and fill in the rest of the holes, and then we'll have more mass. And that's exactly what we did. We filled that old wall in with scrap sheet, you know, sheet rock, and then we put plaster black on it. And there's that wall ready to be plastered. You can see uh, up above here, 
where the vent will be, this whole balloon is going to act as a solar collector. Anytime it gets too hot, a fan is going to draw heat off, take it into the old house, and drop it down in the hallway of the old house and distribute it there. So the whole room in this case is a solar collector. Here's that wall finished, stuck over. Paint green. Turns out elm green is a very good way to absorb sunlight. I don't know why, but it is. It's not quite as good as black, but it's pretty much there. And most people accept an elm green wall if they won't accept the black wall. <laughs> so, wet well, is common with the uh, brick fireplace, the brick chimney also. So there we have the vent taking the heat out. Here's the return vent down below. We have a rail and some plants that begin to flesh out. Here's a little shower area down. Uh, at the base uh, in, in the hot tub area. Here's the same kind of framing system. This is all local uh, rough sawn lumber, all sawn in the area, which is always a good thing to do. Here's a view from the, the uh, parents' suite out into the uh, hot tub area. Here's the kind of drama and daylight you get in the solar space that makes it exciting. Here's looking up at the balcony above uh, and some of the plants. Here's looking down from the balcony above. Uh, this is shared light. The sun space is to the left. We share light into this loft space behind it. Uh, here's the big curtain. It's a mylar, so my, uh, aluminized mylar curtain that goes down to uh, preclude heat in the summer when not wanted and to reduce heat loss in, in the winter when the sun's not out. Uh, and here's the house in general uh, on the south. The shrubs are encouraged. Landscaping can make a big difference in energy use of the building. Uh, here's that closet area on the north again. Here's the, the doors closed. The windows are behind the uh, windows are behind there. And, and here. Let's see what's happening. Okay, here's an addition on a uh, existing little one-story house. There used to be a garage here. The owner is a uh, musician who uh, plays chamber music with friends, wants to have a living room, music room added on with the garage. And the first move is we're on the North Street side of the house. Uh, it, it turned out to be a benefit uh, in terms of noise also to not have any windows on this north side. And there's a little airlock created. Uh, which is also another good move. We have a door into an entry space, which these people never had. And uh, it's also a good way to reduce heat loss in the residence is to have that kind of airlock where you do stuff like take off the boots and whatnot. Here's uh, the entry from the parking. The uh, curb up there is to allow that tree to grow uh, to make a move there, an architectural move. Here's the entry into the house. Uh, here's the airlock, a little bit of daylight, a little bit of cross ventilation, bottom to the left and the door to the right place to put stuff when you come in. And here's the solar music room. Um, just a, two sets of south facing uh, next windows, one to the east just to make it more expansive. We have a skylight here. Once again, I don't necessarily recommend a skylight. Uh, a skylight is a good to, way to have natural thermal siphoning. The manufacturer now is responsible for if they're leaking, you know, and uh, it's a good way to cut a hole in the roof in this case to get ventilation. So these are operational skylights that are used to put ventilation in more than light. Uh, they're kept small so there's not a lot of overheating. Here's the space. Uh, these windows have, you can just get a flavor for it, they have uh, little thin shades in them. So I, I show these slides to show you that there is some valuable stuff in that room, a nice little big grand piano and a cello, but there's never been a problem with sunlight overheating, okay? Uh, or they damaged any of that because of the sun control in the window. That's the, that's the uh, windows right here. There's a beautiful sky. Uh, sometimes when you're doing solar work, you're actually just removing interior walls. Here's some rooms uh, that have good daylight, uh, but that used to be a, just a two foot six inch wide opening, okay? Busting it out to get something like deeper into the house, likewise. That just used to be a two foot six wide opening with plenty of daylight on one side and we bust it out to get more daylight on the inside. Sometimes you're playing around with surfaces to brighten and lighten up the space. Mirrors are perfect reflectors. Uh, 
Uh, and this is actually the dressing area. Those are all closet doors. But the room is that much lighter and brighter. Sometimes the coat of paint is a real good solar room. Uh, here's a project of uh, significant scale, which I showed to talk about the roto lid, which uh, and the reflectance. You can see the metal roofs, which are reflecting more sunlight into the um, you know windows that are above them. <coughs> On the roof, you have a, a skylight. The skylight's uh, you know going to be a big heat loss unless it has some heat management in it. Here's the interior view during the framing stage. Here's the skylight actually being installed. Uh, here's where the skylight installed, getting ready to put up this panel and roof. Now there's the rotor lid. The rotor lid is a, a panel which can be in this position or symmetrically can be in that position. Oops, sorry about that. I'm going to have to find the reverse button. Okay, it can be in that position or in that position or it can actually be in this position. And in all three of those positions, it has a seal on the corners and the edges. So this is probably in the summer, and it's facing south and precluding sunlight from coming in. In the winter, it would be exactly opposite. On the north, reducing heat loss out the north, letting sunlight come in on the south. And at night, it would be across the bottom, reducing the heat loss. So this is a uh, rotor lit system that's been developed for uh, skylight. Uh, once again, just as a reminder, here's the fireplace in that house. If you do solar work, you stop working with materials like this. Okay. Uh, here's something. This house actually had a ground source heat pump as the main uh, heating system. I mean, it actually turned out pretty well. Uh, when you need to have air conditioning, you need to ground source heat pumps. Uh, not infrequently. And they're a good way to uh, reduce the amount of energy required by a normal heat pump because what they do is rather than try to draw their heat from the atmosphere, which can sometimes be quite cold, uh, their heat comes from the ground, which is, is normally less uh, less cold even in the day. Uh, here's the project that I built for those people whose house I insulated early on. I told them to show you. This is a little solar home in the woods in New Jersey, and it's. Um, this is in the summer, it's on a very steep slope. The main floor of this house uh, is off this patio area. That's the main floor on this level with uh, living room, dining room, that kind of stuff. Down below is the bedroom spaces. And up above is a clear story office type of space. And that's where uh, much of the solar gain is. The scheme here is to have sunlight come in up high in the forest using the stairwell to bring sunlight down through those three stories. Uh, here's the south elevation. These are, these are significant amounts of windows. You know, they were small. There's the bed, master bedroom over here, parents' bedroom. There's a little airlock entry, the guest room, and then uh, this is like a planting room and the kitchen and up top of the storage. Now this house had a conflict between view and south. These folks really wanted to view out to this in the east, down to a creek. And so we made some concessions, put more, some more windows on the east than I might would, I would have liked from an energy point of view. But uh, those windows, even some of them, we went with this bay to get these panoramas, and so that this, uh, this window was more southerly, or almost equally southerly as it was east. Uh, here's the north once again. I'm sorry for the dark color, but you can see barely any windows at all on the north. Uh, none, none of this happens, by the way, is very dark. That's the north to the right. Here's all that uh, solar getting on the left to the south and the uh, uh, library space upstairs. Here's the light coming down to the center of the house on the main level. And uh, here's the light coming down into the, uh, at what would be the basement. Here's the uh, parents' bedroom with the south lady to the right and the panoramic views. And here's the kitchen, same uh, thing, taking advantage of the views on the side. Uh, here's the solar kitchen. Uh, actually, in addition, I didn't make the solar space, so I won't take credit for that. It's a solar space up to the right. This is the 
the uh, solar space and this the plant shelf with the solar light coming down to what used to be a very uh, drab, ugly, badly planned kitchen. It was not very wide. It's about 11 feet wide. It's very long, which is ironic. It's a giant room. But in that 11 foot width, there wasn't enough room to uh, do anything in terms of a, uh, an island or such. And these people are very serious cooks. So she, she's one of the for they're cooking. Um, so I came up with this scheme which uh, had all these corner conditions and created these work areas. And when you have corner conditions in the kitchen, you usually end up with a lazy Susan. And I felt it was a shame to uh, hide a lazy Susan in a square carcass. So there were these cylindrical carcasses, and that's how that scheme it up. Okay, that's it. If you bear with me, I got one half of the slide thing left, and then I'm done. Yes, that's um, This is an addition, a uh, two story solar addition. Uh, the windows are facing up to the southern windows with a new patio. It's going to be a, a kind of a TV living area on the first floor and actually exercise room on the second floor. Uh, the patio is all part of the addition also. Uh, the requirement here, not uncommonly, was that it had to look like nothing happened. You know, effectively done. Uh, they wanted to match the house. It's awesome what people want. Uh, so basically, they pick up a wall was there on the outside, but on the inside, we're given a little more latitude. And uh, this is the two-story sun space in the center. It creates a new focus for the house. The front door is down the end of the hallway. This space actually used to be outside of the house. Here's. Uh, Here's looking up uh, in the living area, and then up above into the gym is what's above here. Now those, those checkerboards are actually uh, little glass tiles in the floor. I had promised the people they'd have more light after I got done with the addition than before in the kitchen, so I threw all my tricks at this one. And that's actually a glass block floor. Uh, we sort of custom made a little bit of get another view on them later. Here's looking around, you've got a fan to, to bring your heat down. You've got a glass block into some of your private spaces, like in the parents' bedroom. You've got a little balcony to the left, a little enclosed balcony to the right. There's a glass block, uh, floor tiles, and then a window out to the south on the top. Uh, this was clever, if I don't say so myself. The existing stair, we actually just clamped around it a new rail to try to uh, modernize it really up to the woodworking of the rest of the addition. So we said the expense of replacing all the spindles and everything just by putting the new rail on there. Uh, here's the view from the top of the stairs. The same thing. We've got masonry on the floor. We've got uh, uh, glass, you know, transmitting light in various places off of the main sun spaces looking over into the uh, slow exercise room on the second floor. Here's from the bedroom out to the exercise room. You can see the glass block is on the inside of the mirror, uh, trying to provide daylight and the stand the mirror. The TV in the center, which rotates either to the bedroom or to the exercise room. Um, and there's those glass blocks in the floor. So customized item. Uh, now, this last project is actually a follow up on uh, the first solar house. Uh, it's not the last one I did, but uh, it makes sense to bring it in last year. Um, the silo house actually had a fire in 1993. Fortunately, nobody was hurt. Uh, and it was put out before really extensive damage was done. They had burned wood there for 20 some odd years and maintained everything. But for some reason, there was a blizzard, but we thought it was the blizzard of 93. It happened one night the next morning when they lit the first fire. They had uh, full involvement of the collector on the roof, and uh, inside of structurally sound, massive charring of this roof, and this whole collector on the top was just destroyed. Good. So being the nearest guy, I was asked to come over and deal with all the fire insurance issues and come up with a settlement. Now, this raised a lot of questions to me. Uh, on the one hand, I mean, as silly as it might be, it is kind of an historic building. It was the first solar, the solar house in New Jersey in recent time. And so it deserves some amount of restoration. 
On the other hand, I knew it didn't work too very well. And there were so many things I had learned since we first built it. It didn't seem like I would want to just restore it. That would seem foolish. So I eventually uh, came to look at the fire as kind of, you know, an avenue to improve on the original intentions. And the uh, insurance guy went along with it. He didn't much know what to do. He came out and was told, you know, roof damage by fire. And he had to make a settlement on this one. So, uh, the decision was made to redesign what, the, what it was going to be. It, the house had always been actually being in the woods and such, it always been a little dark and so on. So we were going to get more daylight, more direct gain. There were some roofing problems, we were going to solve some of those. And maybe even get some new loft space on the second floor. So the scheme was to come up with some new glazing plans, kind of like a pair of eyeglasses on the house. And, uh, it took a while to notice that a single plate of glass could actually intersect those three cones and, and uh, you know, work. But it turns out it could, and so that was a really big breakthrough on the design. At that point, we built some models, and uh, you see here it's a combo model, a little model, you just look at, and then a bigger model of the skylight system. The intention here was to uh, do some actual sunlight studies. The model, uh, the bigger model has viable materials, you know, it's got a glazing material. I want to really see how the reflection of the light goes in there. It's hard to get. That's sitting on a tripod which can be adjusted as if it's any day or hour of the night, of the, of the year. And uh, so we actually did some serious sunlight study. Here's one, for instance, in March at 12 noon. And it shows that even with a vaulted side skylight, there's no, no solid parts of the back of that skylight. By the shadow, apparently very little light gets through that skylight. So most of it's ending up in the building. Unfortunately, this wasn't the case year-round. So the decision was made to make the skylight flat on the front and have a curved and mostly solid roof on the north. Uh, the, the, uh, the roof was not solid as to one aspect. In the center, in the, where the big circles are to the right and left, had always been open. You could see right through the building. And to preserve that feature, which was an important feature of the original design, there was glass put on the north part of the uh, building where those two circles are. <clears throat> so here was the basic scheme at that stage of the game, and we went out to construct it. First, of course, was demolition. We did a lot of recycling. Recycled all the metals and all the wood went to its firewood. And uh, in, in setting that as a parameter to recycle, we actually created the building. Because it had always struck me that the main side of the roof, which we were going to tear apart, the structure was still sound. And why was I going to spend a lot of money and time and effort tearing it apart and putting it in a dumpster when it still was a structural roof? Well, there was plenty of room on the site. We decided to brace it, cut it free of the house, and for the price of a crane, which was a lot more, less than the price of a dumpster, lift it off the house and use it as an outbuilding on site. That's what we have here. Uh, we've done a model study on that also to see how we can do it. Um, so here it is braced, being lifted off the house. Here it is being lowered onto these posts, which are waiting for it. And here we have a little building in the woods, which is good for storing wood or whatever. Uh, you know, and it was all done because the goal was to not, you know, waste material, but rather to come up with some way to recycle. So here's everybody's dream house in the woods without a roof. Um, we then proceeded, obviously, to frame the roof, the new roof, and sheet it. And uh, then we were able to frame these, the skyline system to the south. This was, we had chosen a skylight system that we would install on wood framing by us. It was a uh, aluminum glazing system, three inches wide. And uh, it's, I forget the name of the company. I don't remember it's in there. Uh, anyhow, we framed with two by material and then put on both sides of the two by uh, plywood, finished plywood. And for this house, which was very rustic, that then served as a finish. And it also made the framing three inches wide, which is exactly what the glazing system is. Uh, this is the north side where we're framing up for the uh, uh, roof on that side of the house. 
And here we are, we've done all the Zoom work on the end of the collectors. And uh, we're probably getting ready to install glazing. Here we are putting it in glazing. I've been kind of scared about what the glazing might look like. But in fact, as this photo shows, under some conditions, it actually makes the whole upper thing disappear. Uh, at other times, it disappears. And you can look right in on the old truss that's in there, the red truss. So it, it worked out quite well in that aspect. And um, here's the north side of it, which was done up with a membrane roof uh, in white. It's long since turned dark gray from all the drop-ins in, in, uh, um, in the forest, which is exactly what I wanted it to do, just mellow out real quick. Here's one of the little loft space that, spaces that was created by that angled roof. Uh, so we got some new space into the thing. Once again, I cautioned you, I had 20 years history with this site. I knew that in the summer there is no sunlight coming in there. Most people in the summer walk in there and doubt that it could possibly be a solar site because the deciduous trees are all covered with leaves and you know they fall off in the winter. So in this case, uh, I knew I could use slope glass without a big heat problem in the summer. Um, the slope came from having it sit on structure in the adjacent side of it. And it was also a good solar in 60 degrees. Here's up uh, near the peak of the collector. Uh, here's the north side with the turbo chargers as well. Those are once again thermal. Those are air vents. That's where the hot air will rise out of these uh, collector areas in the summer when we want to get rid of it. And, um, Here's the inside. You see the yellow is actually one of those rubber balls you used in grade school. They come in yellow and blue and red, and that's how it's plugged up. I had come up with that so it's uh, So that's how the turbocharger gets plugged up. And you see the stained glass is uh, worked in there as uh, solar art. It's a good location for it. And, uh, I'm slide to drop a little bit. Okay. Uh, so, in any case, here's a view looking up uh, in the center silo now. Uh, the uh, ceiling is being used as a um, reflector for these lights, so you get indirect lighting, you get that kind of exposed frame, and you get your sun uh, art, because except at 12 noon, there's always sunlight behind that <coughs> stained glass. So it uh, works well in this case. Uh, there's the house with a little snow cover on it before it's melted off the glass, which is a good sign. It's a very insulated glass. Um, and there it is in the fall. The new 1990 you know, model silo house is uh, so, much, so much better than the old 1970s silo house. So, uh, in parting, let me just remind you that all that uh, photosynthesis is the basis for our whole existence and it really supports us fully <laughs> and that we shouldn't forget about it in our endeavors and that no matter how big or how small even the smallest solar project I ever worked on that one little south facing basement window no matter how big or small your building is there's probably either a solar or a conservation move you can make and uh, to a great benefit of it yeah. and I would like to thank you for your support and uh, for putting up with all my reflections. Are there any questions?